chapter 15, and I don't know about you, but I, I, I was really touched by um, this song reminding me, reminding us all of the Father's love for us, and Jesus speaks this parable to lost sheep. He, he speaks this parable to you, to me, um, the Father's love for you, and what God will do to reach you as a sinner, and we're all sinners, and Luke 15 what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and, and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance. Amen. 
That's the Father's heart. The Father's heart is for the sinner who needs to repent. And I don't know where you're at this morning in your life, but God is seeking you. God is seeking to have an intimate relationship with you. And he wants you to repent, to embrace him as your Lord and Savior. I hope you do that today if you haven't done it. Uh, I wanted to just share with you, if you're visiting with us today, if you haven't been with us here in a while, um, just this, the brochure has a little tear-off card that you can tear it off. If you have a prayer request, if there's something going on in your life and you would like to uh, communicate that to me, for me to reach out to you, prayer requests, um, something going on in your life, please fill this card out, tear it off, put it in the, in the, in the uh, um, offering plate when it comes by later on. And... Um, if you're visiting with us today, please take the time to fill it out so we can get a record of your attendance with us, and that's a way for you uh, to take that step and say, hey, I want to get to know this church, and we want to get to know you, and we'll reach out to you uh, accordingly. Why don't we take a little bit of time to go around and greet one another and welcome each other to the fellowship that we have here at Calvary Baptist. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Joanna. Good morning. <laughs> great. off with a word of prayer. You guys can have a seat. We're going to do something a little different now um, where the song that is the next song that's going to be sung is a special uh, that the ladies have prepared uh, to bring us into worship, worshiping the Lord. Uh, so um, are you going to have the lyrics up there? No? I don't. Okay. All right. Maybe next time we'll do that so that that, that way you guys can see the, so the words that they're singing, but it, uh, it's a powerful song, and uh, it's meant to help us worship the Lord. So let me pray again and ask the Lord to bless our time, all right? God, we give you thanks and praise for uh, your goodness to us. Uh, thank you for uh, the gift of music, and thank you for the truth that uh, you've given to us. And I pray, God, that you would have your way in all of our hearts, that we would submit to the truth, we would worship you. And, and that you would be glorified in our response to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, powerful songs remind us of what God, how God feels about us, what God wants to do in our lives, who God is, and uh, what He's made us. I think it's wonderful to see uh, God work in our church. Uh, 2014, if you were with us in 2014, that was the last time we had uh, sort of live music right, where we used to have a, a drum set over here, um, um, we had a guitar player, and we had a, you know, it was pretty, pretty powerful, and uh, it's great to see um, God using the gifted people and the talent, talents that they have to help us worship the Lord, so I commend all the ladies, and Michaela, I don't know where she went, uh, and the hard work that they uh, um, sacrificed time away from family to, to prepare those songs, so I hope there was a um, a, a blessing to you. So, now we're going to turn our attention to the hearing of God's Word. And I hope those songs help prepare your heart uh, for the hearing of God's Word. And so, guess what we're doing? As you see on the overhead there, we're now jumping back into 1 Corinthians. And um, we took a little break from, the, from 1 Corinthians because we were dealing with some spiritual disciplines that we needed to hear about. And now we come back to this letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. He actually wrote two letters. If you know uh, biblical history, he actually wrote three letters. One of the letters were lost, but that's probably a different subject or a different conversation to have. Two letters that we have in God's word that he's written that are inspired by God and are meant for your and my admonition for our, our lives as Christians. And so what I want to do, since we're, at, we're coming back into 1 Corinthians, I thought I'd start off with just one verse that kind of can be used to connect the things that, have, that we've already covered and bring us further forward in our understanding of this letter that God has given to us to learn about, 1 Corinthians. And so let me read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter. 10 verses 1 through 14. I'm only going to teach from verse 13, though, but I want to give the overall context of what we're looking at and then pray and ask the Lord to bless this sermon to our lives. Hear the word of the Lord. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and, and in the sea and ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. These are all Old Testament things he's bringing up. But, he says in verse 5, with most of them God was not pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things, what he just talked about, became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And then he gives examples in verses 7 all the way down to verse 11. And, and he says here, And do not become idolaters as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality, as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These are all Old Testament examples of what God did and why he was displeased with the Israelites as they were wandering around in the wilderness these are all examples, he says. And again, he brings out in verse 11. Now, all these things happened to them as examples. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So twice, he says, it's for our example. Look at it, verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 
Then in verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. That's the word of the Lord this morning. Let me pray and ask the Lord to use this passage in our lives this morning. Lord, we want to ask you, plead with you to help us to focus on the hearing of the word of God, that your spirit would work in all of our hearts, that we would hear and hear well, that we would not only hear well, but we would apply your word to our lives um, and be become a follower of Christ if that's what needs to happen. Or as followers of Christ, we would take that next step of obedience to become complete in your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus. And so use this time that we have to benefit us spiritually. We look to you to feed us in Jesus' name. Amen. So today, on this Lord's Day, as we return to our study in 1 Corinthians, some might ask, why are we studying or learning about people who lived way back in ancient times? What good is this going to be for my life? Well, today's topic is the temptation to sin. So regardless of how old these writings are, the concept of the temptation to sin is something that we can all relate to, and it's something that we're all going through. In our passage today, in verse 13, you will notice that the word temptation or tempted is used three times. It's a very important topic and very important subject, and verse 13 brings this powerful truth that we all have to deal with as Christians. It doesn't get any better for a Christian when we deal with sin and the temptation to sin. Well, Because the Corinthians, who is a church that was planted by Paul on one of his missionary journeys, had many problems, they were struggling in their walk with the Lord. And so before we look at the details of verse 13, it might be helpful for all of us, and maybe you weren't here when I was teaching, we left off at verse, uh, I went through actually um, last year, I believe it was, through verses 1 through 13. And so, just to remind us of what is the reason why Paul even wrote this letter, and maybe it'll help us connect this verse to our own study this morning. What were the problems that were going on in the Corinthian church? Well, in chapter 1, he talks about the divisions that were taking place. There was carnal living, and they were were not thinking uh, and focusing the way they ought to be focusing on. They were looking at Paul and saying, Paul is my leader, or they were looking at another teacher named Apollos and saying, oh, he's my leader or whatever. They were just focusing on the people that were leading them and the church was being divided and, and uh, that was one of the problems the church had. The church also had the issue of immorality, sexual immorality, uh, the, the pagan or worldly way of, of living in this world and just having sex with whomever you want to have sex with had not been a broken pattern in their life, and it came into the church. And so there was issues of sexual immoralities. There were also issues of disagreements. In 1 Corinthians 6, there were people not getting along, believers not getting along with each other, and so they were threatening to actually sue each other and bring their their issues, their problems of reconciliation, bringing it before the world. In other words, laying down all their dirty laundry for the world to see that, and Paul says, no, we ought not to do that. We ought to settle our problems within the church the way God designed it to be. And then there are also, in this letter that we've already studied, there are marriage and divorce issues. New believers were now, maybe, for instance, the husband would get saved, and the wife did not become a believer yet, and they, now you have a mixed marriage, a saved person living with an unsaved person, and it's, it's their new faith, and they're trying to figure out, should I leave my unbelieving uh, husband because he's an unbeliever? And so they were struggling with these issues. And so we looked at that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Uh, there were also issues of, of living by the conscience. Their conscience was being convicted, and there were weak believers whose conscience was being convicted because their, their, in their society, they would go to the, to, the, um, to the market and buy meat to eat. And some of that meat had been offered to idols. 
And so the weak believers were looking at that and seeing stronger believers buying the meat, and it was convicting them, and they were being bothered by this whole issue of living by your conscience. And so Paul had to address that. And then he also addressed the issue of idolatry, where they were taking their pagan ways of worshiping, what they used to worship prior to becoming a believer, and they brought that into the church as well. And then Paul corrects their thinking about their money and the idea of giving and tithing. Those were issues that were this church was struggling with. And so Paul corrected all of these things and trying to get them to see that they need to run the race that they have been given as a Christian and to run that race faithfully. They're not to give in to sin. And so he used the metaphor, and that was, if it's maybe familiar to you, in 1 Corinthians 9, Paul begins to talk about this metaphor of a race, that, that we're running this race, and we need to be disciplined in the way we run or walk or live our Christian life. And that is what led us into a series of messages on the spiritual disciplines, that we discipline our life as Christians. And now as we come to chapter 10, he uses these Old Testament saints as examples for them to learn from. That they felt they were being tempted and some of them gave in to the temptation and as we read, they fell into sin. Sin of idolatry, sin of sexual immorality, the sin of tempting Christ, the sin of complaining, right? Uh, All of those were things that the Israelites had fallen into. And now Paul says, you also, Corinthians, are falling into these same types of sins. Some of you are are fighting and you're handling the temptation. But other believers in the Corinthian church were not. And so Paul is addressing it. And so you and I, too, just as the Corinthians, need to know how we handle the temptation to sin. When we become believers, when we become followers of Jesus Christ, when we turn from our sins and we trust the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to follow him, we need to learn how to deal with temptation. Temptation is going to come in your life and it's going to come in my life. And where does it come from? Well, temptation comes from three different sources. And all of these sources that I'm going to tell you this morning, these three different sources of of temptation... They're all our enemies. We're not to be friends with these, te- with these sources that I'm going to mention. The first source of temptation that is our enemy is the internal enemy, the internal one. The, that, is, that is the flesh. And when I say the flesh, I'm not speaking about our physical body, but I'm talking about the inner person that is called the fallen nature, uh, the, the sinful nature. That sinful nature has sinful desires. It it craves after sin. It craves and longs after that which is unholy. This fallen nature that is still living in all of us is craving and longing after that which is unholy. If you're here this morning and you've never turned from your sin, You've never turned from your sin. You never repented from your sin and trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That flesh, that fallen nature is still controlling your life. It is the operation operation manager of all the affairs in your life. It is controlling your life. But as a Christian, the flesh no longer controls you. That, that, uh, That control has been severed. That doesn't mean it's not there. It doesn't mean the battle is not going to be, be, be intense. It just means that it's no longer controlling your life. The flesh desires and longs to control the believer's life. It is our enemy. And temptation comes from this, listen, temptation comes from this inner desire to sin that we all have to face. A passage of Scripture that brings this out clearly is in James chapter 1. Verses 13 through 15, where God's word says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted, listen to these two words, by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Because that's evil. 
God, God is not evil. God is holy. But listen to what it says in verse 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire, when that desire has conceived, using the word uh, for uh, giving birth to something, when it has conceived, it gives birth to sin. That is how you and I sin. When we give in to the sinful nature that is living in us, that's how it happens. We're enticed. The temptation is there. Our inner nature, the sinful person living inside us, desires that. And it's pulling us toward it. But it's not sin when it's, temp- when it's just temptation. It is sin when we give in to that temptation in an evil way and it gives birth to sin. But listen to me. Look at the rest of that verse. Don't just think that your sin is done with. That you sinning is no big deal. Because it says, sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, death means you're separated from God because of your sin. But as a believer, sin also damages your life with God. It brings forth death in a sense that you're disconnected from God. Your fellowship is no longer there with God. You're no longer intimate with Him. You're no longer close to Him. You need to deal with sin and thank God. God is faithful and merciful that if we do sin and give in to our flesh, which we do, He is faithful and He loves us and He wants us just to confess that sin to Him and ask for His forgiveness and He does forgive us. Amen? So we have the internal enemy, the flesh. Don't become friends with it. Don't cuddle up with it. Don't act like it's not there. It is there and it is tempting you to sin. Secondly, we have the external enemy, which is called the world. Now, by the world, I don't mean the creation, which God created for us to enjoy. The physical world is under a curse by God, and it needs to be redeemed, and it will be someday. But that physical part does not tempt us. The world is also a system a philosophy, a system. And the Bible says that that system is under the sway of the evil one, Satan. Listen to how John puts it in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. We know that we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The world, as, as it says there, it, it defines that the world is under the sway, under the control of, under the power of the wicked one. He's making a distinction. We know we are of God. Believers are of God, but the world is not of God. And it's under the power, the influence of the wicked one, the evil one, which is Satan. The world says to us, look out for yourself. Don't place others before you and your needs. The world says, let's settle our differences with a fight, with a war, not with peace. Uh, The world says, take what you want out of life. Don't wait for anybody else. Don't be patient. The world says, acquire, accumulate, for a man's possessions and achievements are the evaluation of a successful life. Not giving to others and serving in some obscure place, giving your life away for others. The world appeals to our sense of pride, our lust for power, and our desire for pleasure. That's the world. This is why we are warned, again, by the same writer in John, 1 John chapter 2, uh, how we should feel about the world. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's how you know if you're a believer or not. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And then he says, listen, those of you who are loving the world, the world is passing away. It's going to be destroyed someday and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. You want to abide forever? You want to live forever and enjoy God's presence? Don't love the world. Abide by the Father's will. Our third enemy is called the infernal enemy, the devil. By infernal, I'm not just talking about the characteristics of hell, but the person, the being of Satan himself. And he has many names. Satan has many names which show his true character. He is known as the adversary, our adversary. 
He is known as the devil. He is known as Satan. He is known as the evil one. All of these names reveal his true character and his true desire, and which that is to ruin our lives, to ruin everything that is holy and good and all that belong to God to bring us to ruin. Now, saying all that, I don't want to give the devil too much credit. I don't want to neglect him either. I don't want you to think that you can just fall back and say, ah, the devil made me do it. The devil can't make you do anything against your will. But you can give place to him in your life. The devil, the devil doesn't make us do anything, but he does make sin attractive. He makes sin attractive. He, he whispers to you and to me, and he says things like this. You have the right to be angry and bitter. You have that right to be angry and bitter. Why? You deserve this. You need this because you're special. And no one else appreciates you, not even God himself. And in a sense, that's what Satan was doing to Jesus. That's what Satan was doing to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, saying to them, why, isn't, why is God keeping this tree of the, of the knowledge of good and evil from you? I mean, uh, why is he keeping that from you? To Jesus, he says, Jesus, how come, how come your father is not feeding you? Why are you fasting for 40 days and 40 nights? Over and over again. He tells us that if you just live the way you want to and live by the world, it'll solve all your problems. He shoots these fiery darts of doubt and discouragement in our lives to, in order to influence our thinking. Not only our thinking, but our feelings and so on. All of it is to make us turn from God. So these are our three enemies that bring temptation into our lives. We can overcome these temptations to sin because God's word for us today is meant to both warn us, warn us of the danger of temptation, but also to encourage us that God has provided a way of escape. God has provided a way of escape. So look at verse 12, and this is the first point I want to make with you regarding how to overcome temptation. Number one, we don't want to be overconfident. We don't want to be overconfident. He says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. The first area of defense regarding temptation is not being overconfident. This was the Corinthians' problem. They were overconfident. So Paul tells them in verse 12, take heed lest you yourself, you think you're standing, you think you're above the temptation, you think you're above the, the lore of sin, the power of that pull, but you're not. You're not. And that's why he gave those examples of what happened to the Israelites. And Paul is saying, you're not above it. Just what happened to them can also happen to you. And all of this is written for your example and for my example. And so in verse 6 of chapter 10, he says all of these things became our example to the intent that we should not lust after the evil things as they also lusted. And in verse 11, the same thing. Now all these things happened to them, again, the same word, as examples. And listen, they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. All that happened to the Israelites could happen to the Corinthians. And all that could happen to the Corinthians can happen to you and to me as well. We need not be overconfident of our lives. He lists these various evil things that brought them to ruin. Uh, they lusted or they craved after evil things. That's their inner person, their sinful nature. Uh, they went after idolatry, sexual immorality. They were testing God and they were complaining. The Corinthians were falling into the same things that Paul was pointing out to them. So they were overconfident in their own ability to handle the temptations in life. Well, how about you? What about me this morning? Are you overconfident in your walk with Christ? How do you know if you're overconfident? Well, overconfidence is revealed in different ways. As you sit here this morning, you are overconfident and you are living, if, if you are living with the attitude that I am not a weak sinner that needs God's help. 
As you sit here this morning, if you don't see yourself as a weak sinner in need of God's grace to help you, you don't need to remember what Jesus did for you on that cross. If, you do, if you're not preaching the gospel and the cross and what that means to your life on a daily basis, you're living your life in overconfidence. You are also overconfident if you are not partaking in the daily bread that God offers for you each and every day. And what is that daily bread? It is God's words. God is offering to feed you every single day spiritual food. And if you're not disciplining yourself to get into God's word, if not every day, as much as you possibly can, hearing God's word and thinking about the things of the Lord, if you're not doing those things, some kind of discipline in your life, you are overconfident. You think that you're strong, and you know what's going to happen? Just as he says here, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. You are going to fall spiritually if you haven't fallen already. It's going to come in your life. Well, you know that your attitude is right, and you are not overconfident if you are praying. Something like this, Father, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. If you, know your, if you know your weaknesses and you are trying to fill your life with Christ and his word, you are not overconfident. But if you are living as a Christian in your own strength and in your own wisdom, you are setting yourself up for a fall. And when temptation comes, you will fall into sin. You will fall into sin. And as I said earlier, temptation itself is not sin. Giving in to that temptation is a sin. So when I am tempted to look or to dwell on something or something that I ought not to be looking at, and if I give in to that enticement, and I dwell and I look and I begin to go beyond just glancing, I am falling into sin. And so God's word to you this morning is don't be overconfident. But instead, be humble, be truthful, and know your weakness. Trust in the Lord and in his mighty power. And so we can overcome temptation by not being overconfident. Secondly, we can overcome temptation by understanding temptation, understanding the nature of temptation. God is in control of everything that comes in your life and in my life. Every trial, every testing that comes your way and comes my way is meant by God to be something good, to prove our faith by overcoming that temptation. But listen, on the other hand of that, Satan is also bringing trials and temptations into our life, persecutions and things of that nature. And he means for us to fail. And so there's a little bit of confusion when it comes to this topic of temptation because the same word is being used for temptation is also used for the word trials. It is used for the word testings. It's the Greek word perosmos, perosmos. So if you repeat that five times, I'm sure it will help you. No, probably not. No. no knowing the Greek word is not going to help you what, one bit, but I wanted to give that word to you so that when you ever get to the point where you're studying God's word and you see the Greek word, you'll see that word is used. Sometimes the word means Trial or testings. Uh, it is used as for us as believers to prove our righteousness. Case in point, Job. If you're familiar with the story of Job, Satan came to the Lord up in heaven and he asked permission to test Job. And God gave Satan permission to test him, to afflict him. Or it can become an inducement to evil, as we read in James chapter 1. It always depends on our response to the testings. Listen, if we do not resist in God's power, it becomes this solicitation to sin and brings us into ruin. If we resist in the power of God, it is a test that proves our righteousness it proves our character, and it shows the genuineness of our faith if we are faithful. It all depends on our response to that temptation, to that trial, 
to that testing that comes in our life. All of it depends on our response. When the trial or the testing comes to you, when it comes to me, how do you respond to it? How do you respond to difficulties that come to your life? In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Same word. Knowing that the testings, same word, of your faith produces patience. And so when a trial or difficulty comes in your life, if you understand what temptations, trials, and tribulations and all that means, you know that God's in control of it and it's coming into your life to prove your character because God's in control of it. Do you count it joy? 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, pretty much the same thing. In this, this tribulation, this trial, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Why am I being grieved? Why am I going through these difficulties, Lord? Have you ever said that? Look at the next verse. That the genuineness of your faith. Is your faith genuine? Is it real? Well, how do you know? It says, by being more, it's more precious to God than gold that's going to perish, though it is tested by fire, Leave it up there. May be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you know anybody who's godly? Do you know, do you have people in your life that you know, and you kind of look at them and you say, man, I wish I had the Christian walk that they have. I mean, they, they handle things different than I handle. Do you know anybody like that? Just nod your heads. We get done faster. Okay, listen. Do you realize that the people who are godly in your life did not become godly because they just went through life without any problems. Do you realize that everyone who is godly, who has got a godly character, who is righteous, and who is living a life that you and I want to live, they got that way because of trials, because of tribulations, because of difficulties in their life. And when those hard times came, it was a test from God. And God knew that they can handle it, and so God brought it into their life. And that they came through that difficulty trusting God, praying, focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and as they came through that trial and that tribulation, they came through it stronger and a much more godly individual. But if you're avoiding difficulties, and I know I'm there too, okay? We avoid them. We don't want difficulties. We're never going to become the believer, the Christian that God wants us to come without the trial, Without the difficulty, God brings those in our life for a purpose and for a reason, to produce righteousness, to produce character, perseverance in our lives. We can see both God and Satan. Listen to this. This is powerful. Both God and Satan are involved in the temptation of Jesus Christ. Did you know that? In Luke chapter 4, Verses 1 and 2, it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. If you read Mark's gospel, Mark says that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. So catch this. Who's leading Jesus into the wilderness? The Spirit, not Satan. It is the Spirit of God leading the Son of God into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil himself. And so for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus is fasting. He's, not, he, he's hungry. And then all this temptation comes to him. All of it comes to him. It's an unbelievable parable. And so he was tempted for 40 days, 40 nights. He ate nothing. Afterward, when he had ended, he was hungry. And so God intended the test to prove his son's righteousness. But Satan intended to induce Satan to misuse his divine powers and to give his allegiance to Satan. And in the same way, Job was also tested, much the same way. God allowed Job to be afflicted in order to prove that his servant was an upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil Job chapter 1, verse 8. Read Job, just the first chapter. You'll be amazed. 
Satan's purpose was the opposite, to prove that Job was faithful only because of the blessings and the prosperity that the Lord had given to him. You're only faithful to God because God's blessing your life. And if you take away all of those blessings, Job would surely curse you to your face. And what happened? Job's character was proven to be a godly individual. Job didn't have any clue that this conversation took place up in heaven. And here he is on the earth going through all this affliction. God and Satan are often at times working in our life and my, your life and my life. God's testings are meant to bring up, uh, to, are never to bring about evil, but righteousness, Satan always tempts us to go against God. Our response determines the results. Listen to this. God often brings circumstances into our lives to test us. Like Job, as I said, we usually don't know at the time and recognize these things that are happening in our life as a test, right? We don't really realize it. And we don't really think that the, the hard thing that we're going through is coming from God. It's just because of something else, right? But our response to them proves either our faithfulness or our unfaithfulness. How we react to these certain things, and I could probably list a whole bunch of them, but listen to these certain things that you can relate to. Number one, how do you respond, how do you react to financial difficulty? That's a hard time, isn't it? When you have a financial difficulty in your life, how are you responding to that? Well, it's temptations coming. I got a financial difficulty, and then I, I see it's an easy way for me to make money that might be illegal, but no one's going to catch me. I can get away with it. And so I do it. I was tempted by that opportunity. The financial difficulty is there. It's been brought to us by God. Test us. Your character was just proven to be unfaithful because you gave in to the temptation and you went the wrong way. But if you would have said, I'm going to trust God with my finances, I'm going to go to my budget, and I'm going to cut some things out of my budget that I am spending unnecessary money, I'm going to go get some counsel on how to use money more wisely, I'm going to go get a second job, whatever. That's taking the right avenue that God has provided a way for you to escape that temptation that you're going to give into. Does that make sense? How about this? Young people, school problems. Now, nowadays, even us older folks are going to school to finish our education, right? But you have school problems, right? You've got a, a test that's coming up, and you forgot to prepare for it. And now it's coming up, and you figured out a way how to go online, and you Googled it, and you can cheat and get the answers and figure out how to pass this test. You've been, you're being tempted to do it. Or, what can you do? You can go to bed earlier. You can stay up later. There's a lot of other ways to get out of that temptation. But your response to that difficulty is going to prove your character. Health trouble, business setbacks, all of these things test our faith and our reliance upon our Heavenly Father. If we don't turn to Him, however, the same circumstances can also make us bitter, can make us resentful, and can also make us angry. Because why am I having these difficulties? It's almost like we, don't, we think that we're special. We don't deserve these things. And so in order to overcome the temptation of sin, we need to not be overconfident, and we also need to understand temptation. Let me go a little quicker here on, the, on this next point here. All temptation, he says here, is common to all. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. You know what that means? That means that whatever difficulty you and I are going through, it's not unique. It's not special. Believers all over the world are going through the same troubles, the same trials, the same temptations. Your particular situation is not unique. It's common to all. It's not superhuman. It's not supernatural. It's common to all. The characteristics of your, of your trial and my trial are natural. There's nothing special about it. 
It's common to all. All of us go through the same trials, the same tribulations. Listen, millions of Christians all over the world are going through the same tr- struggles. That means there's someone sitting next to you right now that is also going through a trial that maybe you're going through the same trial. Same tr- or if they're not going through it now, they're going to go through it someday, or you're going to go through it. That's why we need each other. There's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to all. That's why we have the church. That's why we need each other. That's why we covenant together to be together as Christians. Each of us have covenant together to, to be a church. That's what's called membership. Let me just read to you some of the things, if you're a member here at Calvary Baptist, that you, that you have covenanted together to be. And so you need to hear this because sometimes you allow the trouble to come in your life And you isolate yourself from your family, not just your physical family, your spiritual family who love and care about you. And so when you become a member of a church, especially Calvary Baptist, we we want to encourage you not to do that. And listen to the covenant that you signed when you became a member. Or you forgot you signed it. It, you You probably don't remember signing it, but you did. You agreed to follow these things. Listen to what it says. Uh, Since we have committed ourselves to Jesus Christ and have experienced the acceptance, forgiveness, and redemption of God our Father, we covenant together as members of this church that with God's help through the guiding presence of the Holy Spirit, here it comes, we will walk together in brotherly love. Do you love your brother? Do you love your sister? We will also do this. We will show loving care for one another and encourage, counsel, and admonish one another. That's what we've covenanted to do together. We've covenanted to care for one another, to encourage one another, to admonish one another. One of, my, one of the things that have brought to my attention that have always been Beth and I's uh, burden is that older saints, if you're one, if you're an older saint, if you're my age or older, you're an older saint, Okay. And if those who of you who love the Lord and you've got some pattern of godliness in your life, there are young people who are coming to this church that need you in their life, that need you to come alongside them and encourage and admonish and help them become like you someday. We need to come alongside each other and speak truth into each other's lives. That's what... It means to be a member of any church. We've covenanted together. And so we overcome the temptation to sin. Number one, by not being overconfident. Number two, by by understanding temptation. That my situation is not unique. I need my brother. I need my sister. And finally, and quickly, we overcome temptation by realizing that God is faithful. Realizing that God is faithful. Listen to the word of God. These four words are so encouraging. It says, first of all, let me read beforehand, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. All right, we've already covered that. Listen to these next four words. They're meant to encourage you. But God is faithful. God is faithful. Say that to yourself. God is faithful. God is faithful. And look look how he describes God's faithfulness to you and to me. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Do you realize that there's no temptation that comes in your life or my life that God has not allowed to come into your life? For instance, God, God knows what you're able to bear. A quick example. At the crucifixion, of, I'm sorry, Prior to the, the crucifixion, they were all in the Garden of Gethsemane. After Jesus prayed, right, uh, the soldiers came to take away Jesus. Jesus made this comment. He made this statement. He said, he said take me, I'm paraphrasing, and let, these, let them go. Why is he trying to get his disciples to leave and just take me and go crucify me? Don't, don't, don't arrest these guys. You know why? Jesus knows that That trial, that tribulation, that hardship would be too hard for his disciples to bear. And so he sent them away. 
He sent them away. And that's what God does in your life and my life. God is faithful. He knows exactly what we can handle. And He will not allow temptation to come in your life or my life that we are not able. Now, listen, I didn't need to clarify this because this doesn't mean that you can put yourself in vulnerable situations like being with, as a married person, being with someone you're not married to in an intimate way and expect nothing to happen. That's not God doing that. That's you doing it. Nor is it the same thing as driving down the street speeding and, and being in that situation and hoping that a police officer is not going to catch you. That's not what he's saying, okay? That's you living your life outside of the will of God and doing your own thing and don't expect God to clean up your mess. Or we make unwise financial decisions and then we're like, oh no, how am I going to do this? Right? And then we expect God to clean up all the mess. That's not what he's saying here. Regular normal things in life, difficulties that come to us, not from our own doing, our own sinful behavior, but from just all of a sudden we're blindsided by this health issue this financial difficulty, this bill that we didn't, ex- didn't know was going to come, and all of a sudden, how do we handle life? He says God doesn't bring anything into your life. That's how God is faithful. Not only is He faithful that way, but He's faithful to provide a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And the way of escape, brothers and sisters, is not always taking the trial away from you. If God always took every difficulty, every trial every problem away from your life and my life, we would be phony people. We would, never, we would never become the mature, godly people that He wants us to become. But all those difficulties, all those trials that are coming to our life are meant to make us righteous, to make us more like Jesus. And so the way that He provides of escape is that He brings us, listen, through the difficulty and that we come victorious on the other side. And while we're going through that difficulty, let me just give you three things that will help you go through that difficulty. Number one, prayer. Prayer. Jesus tells his disciples, um, pray, watch therefore, because temptation is going to come. The, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Pray. Prayer is a wonderful gift that God has given to the believer. Pray. Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. Lord, give me strength. Lord, give me wisdom as I'm going to this difficulty. Instead of trying to handle it on yourself, pray. Secondly, trust. Trust that the Lord is hearing those prayers. Trust that His ear is attentive and He cares about your needs. And he's, He's going to provide a way of escape. He's going to give you wisdom. He's going to give you what you need to get through that difficulty. Would you trust the Lord? Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your way, acknowledge him, and he will what? Direct your path. Trust the Lord. And and lastly, focus on Jesus. Focus on the Lord Jesus. Let me just read this last scripture. It was two pages I didn't even look at, all right? I, I didn't realize how time was flying away. All right, focus on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 3 and 4, the verse prior to this one says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured, right? He endured the shame and he he went to the cross. And then it says, verse 3, For consider him, Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Do not become discouraged. Do not become weary. You have a high priest, Jesus, who can sympathize with all of your weaknesses. And and he was tempted in all points, just as we are. So your temptation, my temptation, Jesus' temptation, they're all the same. They're all the same. So focus on Jesus because he can understand you. He can relate to what you're going through. No one else but Jesus can do that. Look to Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. He's going to bring your Christian life to completion if you trust him, focus on him. And how do we focus on Jesus? You're going to hear it over and over again. You're going to focus on Jesus through his word. His word is living and active and able to 
strengthen you and give you the grace that you need through every trial and every tribulation. And so we overcome the temptation to sin by not being overconfident, by understanding temptations, by knowing that my situation is not unique, and finally, by taking the way of escape that God provides for us. Let's pray, and as I pray and after I pray, during this prayer time, I'm changing the way I do things. I just want us to just pause and reflect on what we just heard. Take time to do business with God. Where you're sitting right now, God's word has been spoken to you. A sacred, holy time. For some, I might have went a little too long. For others, I didn't go long enough, right? So it's okay. This is the time that God brings us together that for the hearing of God's word. You heard God's word. It was meant to warn you of the danger of temptation, but also to encourage you. God's provided a way of escape. God loves you. God loves you. And so as we pause for a moment, everybody bow their heads. Kayla's going to play music a little soft. Just pray to the Lord. Just think about what you just heard.
close in prayer, I uh, just want to let you know that if God has spoken to your heart and you need someone to talk to today, don't run out. You have a brother or a sister, perhaps you might know, uh, someone who can, you could talk to that, that's here, or obviously I hope you know you can talk to me. So make sure you grab my hand and say, Pastor, I need to talk to you, and uh, we'll get you the help that you need. We all need help. We're all weak sinners, and we all need to become strong in the Lord. So let me pray, and we'll take our offering. Father, I thank you and praise you for your goodness and your mercy to us. I thank you for uh, this time of worship and the hearing of the word and the singing. And uh, now we want to praise you and thank you in the giving of the finances and the resources to give back to you. And I pray that you will be honored and glorified in that. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, please have a seat and prepare yourself for the offering as I have the men come forward for the gathering of uh, the collection of the offering. And um, is that enough, guys? All right. Glenn, can you uh, lead us in prayer for the offering?